conversations powered by Just Talk. And he needs to listen. You know it. You know it. And I am Jesse Farrell, professional speaker, coach, executive coach, life coach, and podcaster. And I am Lisa Bybee of Lisa Listen, VP of Sales and Marketing for Just Talk, success coach, and podcaster. And you have, along with me, a special guest in the house. Who, who would say you? Who is that special we guest? We have Mr. Hugh Sinek. He is... Whoa, whoa. How about a round of applause for Mr. Hugh Sinek? <laughs> <laughs> Let's tell it like it is. He is the vice president of customer experience of the customer experience at the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority and short for LVCVA that's that's the one he uh, the LVCVA is the destination marketing organization for the Las Vegas and Southern Nevada and its mission centers on attracting visitors by promoting the destination as the world's most desirable destination for leisure and business travel the LVCVA also owns and operates the Las Vegas Convention Center and Cashman Center. Did you know that? I did not know the last part, but I can tell you this is going to be a very exciting show. Hugh, thank you for being on the show. Yeah. Welcome here, and Happy we are going to have here. a great conversation. Thank you. Hugh, my first question for you is what does the customer experience mean? Well, it's a, a department that was created by our CEO and President Ross Urellicotter back in 2006. And uh, the utmost importance to him is taking care of the customer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he felt that we weren't uh, doing that properly. Uh, if we ever take them for granted, it's a bad mistake. He'd seen that happen in other destinations, and he was determined it was not going to happen in Las Vegas. So that was the top priority. We've got to focus on the customer. So he created this department, and initially it was just one person with an admin assistant, but uh, has since grown, taken on additional responsibilities within the organization. So uh, I think I have the best job in the organization other than maybe his. And wow, I, and you go ahead. No, I have to say that when we, when Jesse and I met with you last month, that I have never met anybody more passionate about their job and for the duration you've been at your job as you. Well, yeah, most people at this stage of their career are thinking and counting days till retirement, but uh, I just am fortunate that I'm doing what I am. It's just like the dream job at toward the end of my career, and so uh, I look forward to going into work every day. I have a great uh, group of people under me that work with me, and. Uh, every day is different. That's the way the LVCVA is. I think it's not just my department. Other people tell you the same thing. Uh, people don't leave there. It's such a great no, that's place to work. That's a story yeah. when you can tell the people don't leave. In fact, our topic today, how to master the customer experience, Hugh is the perfect person to be on to talk about this. You mentioned something even in your early response for the first question that Lisa asked. You mentioned about the the boss. Well, who was the boss that discovered, wait a minute, we need to improve this customer experience. Who was that person? Uh, it's a real special individual. His name's Rossi Rollincotter. He okay. came to Las Vegas at the age of two. Um, he is Mr. Las Vegas. Oh, nice. He's just, uh, he's been with the organization 43 years. Wow. Uh, wow. That's really rare to see something like Especially that. Especially these days. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, he's just regarded as, as the go-to guy in Las Vegas. And when things turned bleak back in '09, and mm-hmm. you know, people are, is Vegas still open or not? Uh, people rallied around him, and he was the one they went to to say, "How are we going to convince people that you know we are active and alive?" And uh, he's been a real leader in the industry, not just in Las Vegas, but nationwide, internationally as well. Well, no, that's huge. And you mentioned that he said that you know that was a bad thing for uh, if, if we deliver a poor customer experience. Not only is it bad, it's also very costly. Mm-hmm. We we actually can't afford it, even though Las oh, no. Vegas has a wonderful name and a I always say all roads lead through Vegas. When I'm traveling, Hugh and Lisa, when I'm traveling, if people, when people engage me, if I don't want a long conversation, they ask where I'm from, I always say Northern Nevada or I'll say <laughs> Reno. If I say Reno, no, no, nothing yeah. against Reno, yeah. they never engage me in any further question. If I say Northern Nevada, they may say, well, where's that? Or they may not say anything. But if I say Las Vegas, I, they won't leave me alone until we get to Vegas. We have, right? uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. We've created a brand called Las Vegas, and it's universal. Yes. Uh, where else do you land at an airport and have people applaud? Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't happen right. very often. <laughs> um, it's just a, a phenomenal story. It's the most unique destination in the U.S. Uh, I go through some of the statistics of the number of hotel rooms, the inventory of over 149,000 rooms, and wow. an airport 10 minutes from anywhere. Right, that's decent right. Decent weather. I mean, it's going to be in the mid 60s next week here that's in crazy. January. But uh, we're a tough competitor for these other cities, but uh, it is something special. Uh, if you meet people wherever you are, once you tell them you're from Las Vegas, yeah, you're right. It's all it, over. It's game on. Yeah. But now you say we're a tough competitor, and we are. We're a force to be reckoned with, but people do also have other choices. So that customer experience, back to you, becomes ex- profoundly important because 
they do have other choices. I mean, Orlando's not a bad choice either with some of the things they have. In fact, it's a very good choice, and they're always in the top three, if I'm correct, right? Right. We just announced that last year 42.3 million people came to Las Vegas. Wow. All time record. Broke last the record year? from the year before, 2015. Yes. Wow. 43 um, million. Yeah. So. You, can you count that high? Because I have trouble. <laughs> I'm not trying to roll you under the bus, but I have trouble after about a million or so. Well, we're not done yet. Okay. We have, and we don't have that much time for him to count that high. Oh, no. So <laughs> another, day, was, another show, another day. We already have a new goal of $45 million, Wow. So, uh, Impressive. Yeah, we can't rest on what we have. And as you know, there's more coming in Las Vegas with the uh, Genting Project. Uh, yes. The Elan Project. We have a brand new arena opening April 1st. Monte uh, Carlo. A lot of excitement. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a beautiful yeah. property. And they're about ready. The Monte Carlo is about ready to raise their game. They're already a very nice property, beautiful property. They're about ready to step up their game, putting that arena there. Because that that's going to bring a lot of magic, both to the facility, to the strip, to our offering, to p- attracting other you know entities here, companies. I'm sure the NBA might be taking a look at that. I don't know for sure. But I, my guess would, why wouldn't they? Oh, absolutely. Have a basketball game yeah. on the strip? At uh, Monte Carlo? Most of the players are here quite yeah. frequently yeah. in the exactly. season, sometimes during the season. But, yeah, I used to serve uh, some of those players during the season. It's really popular. The tax incentives in Nevada, it's a natural. So it's only a matter of time. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. You have more questions for you? Because yes. I want I, I really want to learn more about this. I want our listeners and our audience to hear the magic because this is a wealth of knowledge. This is an institution sitting yes, over indeed. here. Yes, indeed. I mean that in a respectful That's way. That's an old term. Isn't oh, it, it is. I probably, yeah. But I'm an old guy. Oh. How do you build loyalty? <laughs> You know, I think you just have to deliver on a positive experience for everybody that comes through the building. And uh, we talk about when people do arrive in Las Vegas, if they wait in the cab line for an extended period of time or get stuck in traffic at Swenson, Tropicana, uh, they get to the hotel room and it's not ready for them. Those are bad experiences. Mm -hmm. So uh, it all starts from the very beginning. And and Vegas has figured it out. The people in the hotels are really good at it on how they address everybody. But it's just critical that – uh, we don't take anybody for granted. That I love we that. treat everybody as a VIP. It's pretty basic mm. sales 101. But um, our staff, our people have to engage everybody that walks into the building. We have to assume that they're Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. You know, you you just you just don't know. Um, we tell them to stop, help people. Nobody's going to criticize you if you're painting a wall and you can tell if somebody needs directions or is, uh, you know confused. And so we encourage them to do that. Uh, we call it living the brand. Know what's going on in town. Uh, know the building well enough that you can point out uh, where where what's in the building where they need to be. So uh, it's real critical that trickles down throughout the organization. Mm-hmm. Don't you also believe, though, Hugh, that it also comes down to uh, everything you said is all right on point. I agree. Uh, that's also showing seeking to show up to ensure that things go well and pressing on the things that go well. But what about when things don't go well? I, I happen to believe that that creates an opportunity. If you really want to create loyalty with the customer, let some things break mm. and you fix it in a very profound fashion. What are your thoughts? Sometimes uh, those mistakes can be some uh, of the best opportunities. the little things that they remember. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the compliments will come, but yes. it's the negatives that they'll take back. Correct. And whether it's that cab experience or in our building, if there's uh, not enough seating. And uh, last week at CES, we had 176,000 people in town. Wow. See, yes, is a big show. That's Consumer Electronics Show, and that's been coming in for how many years? It's 20, uh, 35 plus, wow. and it's the largest uh, you know trade show held in North America on an annual basis. Wow. And it's right here in Las Vegas. And how many people did we bring in? Over 175,000. And that's why I couldn't get across the strip at certain times? Right. Okay, I get it. Now, I didn't know what was going on. An example of something that goes wrong would be, uh, an example might be an escalator, uh, a critical escalator in a lobby. Uh, if that goes down for an extended period of time, it's it's really a, a problem for the show. So mm-hmm. uh, to correct it this year in particular, we've had uh, our security guards with the key that can reset it if it gets jammed. Uh, we've had uh, our elevator supplier there on call to address issues when they come up. But uh, something like that, it could be down for an hour, but you would think it's all week. So you can't afford to let those type of things happen. No, that's you what can't. they'll remember. You yeah. can, but when they do happen, if when you're in the presence of it, I think how we show up and how we seek to really – embrace and take ownership of that problem and speak for a solution, even if we don't know what the answer is, to affirm and reaffirm that we're going to get to a solution that improves it. I believe that's what starts to help build loyalty because they, they believe you care. You're don't caring. You? And whether it's adding signage, say the elevator's this way, uh, um, you know, just something to help them have a guide there to, to help them and direct them to the stairs or an uh, elevator option Very good. as well. Very good. Bring- and what is the value for pushing excellent customer service? Well, it's retaining these shows. I mean, the economic impact on our community is enormous. 
Um, typically, it's over seven billion dollars. The uh, the flow into seven Las Vegas billion. seven annually. million dollars coming from tourism. Yes, wow. wow, annually. Wow, and think about what you folks have done over there with the month of December. Before the Cowboys were coming to town, right. we almost shut down in December. Am I right? We did. And, and you've been able to retain that business, and there's a lot of competitors trying to get that business from us. Well, it was about a year and a half ago when we woke up to the RJ, and the headline was uh, NFR moves to, to Orlando. Wow. I think it was. Or was it Dallas? It was I don't know, but yeah. But I just know you felt like you had a, a couple pair of hands around your throat when that happened when you woke up, I'm sure. It was uh, not a good feeling. And I thought this, I think <laughs> was it the stomach? Something, was it? <laughs> well, it was all over. And it, I know how important those first two weeks of December are here. And yes. before we had NFR, which this was their 31st year that just concluded in <clears throat> December, uh, the hotels would shut down entire wings because there just wasn't any activity. Nobody wants to travel in December. But that event, bringing it from Oklahoma City you know, they've sold out for over 250 straight shows. Wow. Uh, uh, it's phenomenal. And it's what's come with it and how it's grown uh, at the Orleans and at South Point, all these auxiliary events, Fremont Street. Uh, it's really community wide. It's not just at the Thomas and Mac. Wow. Many people come here and never see the actual rodeo live. Uh, but they're there to be a part of it. The country and Western acts are in town. Uh, yeah. We all become mm -hmm. cowboys. Funny you should say that. Even I was a cowboy. It was actually a number of years ago before we started Just Talk. But black had, hat or white hat? Uh, black and then a white <laughs> one if I needed it. <laughs> but this uh, be a beautiful uh, intelligence professional that I had an opportunity to assist that was coming for uh, the cowboy period during that December time. I had to get these special tickets. I had to get roping. I had to get... Uh, her name is actually Cher Weldon Jones, and she taught me a whole lot about the quality of why that rodeo was so uh, rich and enriching and the experience that I helped her have as a result of getting primetime tickets through a boss of hers at the time, and her name is Ann Lee, that provided that. That was the first time I understood the magic of the rodeo, and it made me want to go to the rodeo. Uh, and, and I see why people flock here, even if they're not going to the actual show, but they want to be around all that atmosphere. It's a, a great demographic, the people that come. And then uh, in our building, we have something called Cowboy Christmas. Uh, yes. It's like a retail, it's like mm. Boot Barn, but yes. on steroids. And uh, it's just phenomenal. We drew over, I want to say, 130,000 people came through our building over the two-week period. It's open to the public. It's a consumer show. We right. don't have very many. But, right. again, it's all you know feeding off the – if any fire were in here, it wouldn't happen. No. Yeah. That's so it's a game changer for December, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Wow. More questions you have, huh, Lise? What are your – Three magical ingredients for the customer experience. Just yours. And it, it, it doesn't have to be everyone else as long as it's stamped by Hugh. You know, I just think, you know, uh, being responsive to people, uh, know your customer. And I, I tell our salespeople, you don't just know the, the contact and their email and phone. Number. You need to know the wife or the husband. I their love kids. that. How yes. many kids? What's the dog's name? Yeah. You yes. need to get down to that level. What's well that? Even if they're not a customer now, a future customer, you need to stay in touch with them. Uh, you can't just assume, well, they'll call me when they need space or something like that. But you've always got to stay in front of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are companies in this town that are really good at that. Uh, we want to be that way as well. So uh, that's only, is that one or two? Well, that's actually, that's actually a really big one. I like to get in on that. Interesting, you and know, I have never had this conversation. And when I was in marketing back in the day, casino, casino marketing, what you just said was one of my differentiators. What I felt made me different from all the other marketing specialists was exactly what you said. I didn't just get close to the player. I wanted to get close to their significant others, the, the children, and know their names and ages and whether they're in college or high school or whatever that was, and engage them in that conversation, know what's important to them. And it really, all you have to do is ask and people will tell you. Mm -hmm. But when you remember it, it blows them away. When they come in and you remember, you, you're talking about, you're saying their names. You address them by name, and you address the I'm down other kids. Yes, when you call them by name, and you say, "Hey, you know, John, how's USC going, or how's UCLA going, or how's the University of Nevada Reno going?" And they, they light up, and they can't believe that you actually remember them. Because right. most people, a lot of people, focus on that primary, that top, that top customer. Yeah. So I, that's a real brilliant one. So whether it was one or three, it was a really good one. Right. <laughs> and when we had a couple of stats to read here. Okay, go ahead and read those stats. He, let's just let's just see if Lisa can make us go wow with these stats that she researched. Okay, it is six to seven times more costly to attract a new customer than it is to retain an existing customer, says White House Office of Consumer Affairs. Do what, you believe that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, these shows, and, you know, they, they come here for a reason. One, you know, they, they have better attendance if it's held in Las Vegas. 
people have more time to be on the floor show than they would in other markets uh, with uh, the options that we have, uh, eating dinner at you know one in the morning if you want to. You right. can't that's do right. that in a lot of markets. That's so, right. Uh, that's a real advantage to us. But um, to lose a customer, the, the economic impact locally, to recapture them, we can't afford to do that. And like I said, people are nipping on our heels. Our competition is expanding facilities, upgrading. We need to stay up with yeah. it. Yes. And that's one of our plans right now with the uh, – Governor Sandoval's uh, Southern Nevada Tourism Infrastructure Committee that he established that's evaluating uh, some other options, but uh, expansion of the convention center is one of them. So if we have more space here, we can have more shows. Well said. Help fill mm. these rooms that are coming, a growing inventory. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's really the way to do it. It's midweek business. It's business people using credit cards. Right. Uh, that's a great uh, guest to bring to Las Vegas. For sure. Well said. That's a good stat. Okay. 80% of CEOs believe they deliver a superior customer experience but only 8% of their customers agree. Well, I think we've all experienced it when there's a problem and you call for customer service. I recently bought a new TV and going through trying oh. to get some instructions. Oh, we and, did too. Oh, yeah. You did too? Yes. Yeah. It's just, and uh, the funny thing is we never got it working. We had to take it back and get another did, uh, one. And, yeah, and guess and what? That was almost three weeks ago, and I still haven't un- unboxed the new one because I'm afraid it's going to happen again. Yeah, it's very frustrating. <laughs> it is. <laughs> So it's the level below the CEO. It's that type of service mm-hmm. level that I the well people said. interact with. For me at our building, it's not me, but they see the cashier in our restaurants or cafeterias, and that person's a reflection on us. And that person, the impression they're going to make on that customer is huge. Yeah. You know, they don't come interact with me or with Rossi Rollincotter, but right. Uh, right there in front of them, if they're treated, there's a surly attitude. That's what they're going to remember, and it's an unfavorable experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then think about it. I'm sure that you, Lisa probably has one of those stats in there. Is the number of people people go out and tell when there's a bad experience versus the number of people go out and tell when it's a good experience, it's, a, it's an inverse relationship. They're not in our favor. Right. They'll tell a lot more people when it's bad, all bad. So, yeah, yeah what other stats do you have for us? 78% of consumers have bailed on a transaction or not made an intended purchase because of a poor s- service experience says American Express. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, ours is a little bit different because they're coming to our building. It's a captive audience. Yes. They're going to be there, and they don't have a lot of choices. They have to use who we have there. So it's really important that we have quality partners, and we've been really particular who point. we have associated with, and uh, we want to keep it as an open facility, let the shows and uh, people use who they want to different services. But uh, we partner with uh, Airmark for Food and Beverage, uh, Cox Business does all of our voice nice. and data. Uh, we have FedEx for business service and American Express. So I don't think you could get a stronger lineup than that. Yeah, so well over said. the years, we've built it because people recognize those names and they're comfortable with them. They know that uh, there's real strength behind that brand and they are going to get a better experience. You need a supporting cast because you can provide part of it, but you need their support and their expertise yes. to provide the other half that makes it work. Right. Very good. Yep, yep, yep. On average, loyal customers are worth up to 10 times as much as their first purchase. Agree? Yeah, I would, because I know once they come to Vegas, they're going to want to come back Mm -hmm. uh, as long as we deliver. Uh, We just, uh, across the board, not just in our building, but every hotel property and every restaurant and every cab ride, you know. Yes. uh, I get letters sometimes that somehow filter down to me from somebody that had long haul out of McCarran. Um, and I, exp- I answer every one. I'll either call them or email them at least, but get sure. back to them. And sure. people, that really means a lot. Uh, some, you know, it's only a letter. But uh, I've explained to people that to get to stressor, maybe on a Saturday night, there may have been an accident on Swenson, that that sure. might have been the quickest way to get there. Sure. In that particular case, the price that she said or he said wasn't that high. And I said, really, you know, you may have been better off that way. Not They're not all that way. But, right. uh, but the fact of following up and giving a letter and, uh, letting them know you tried. And a lot of those come to me through Mayor Goodman's office or through our CEO, and uh, they say, take care of this. So uh, I think it's real important that we do, and uh, you know that makes a big impression. That will help rally that customer to come back. Well said. Well, well it, it does. Well, it also leaves them feeling great. It leaves them feeling that yeah. you care. Somebody that, listened. Yeah, it leaves them, you, that you listen, that you care, that you're proactive about it, that you're not just reticent about it. When you, Whenever you're out there, we're all consumers in some sense. When you, Whenever you're out there and as a consumer – even if you don't have high demands, you want your most minimal demands being met. Like what is fair and what is right to get you know equal value for whatever it is you're purchasing because you're paying for whatever that service is on some level. Mm-hmm. You want at least the basic level back. When people fall below the basic level of, of proper apology or, or sincerity on the service cycle, 
it leaves a very bad taste in your mouth no matter what that thing is that you're looking to consume. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, I, I really think that becomes big. Your follow-up and follow-through with things like that, I believe that's what's helping your numbers stay strong is, you know, that gets out there too, that you, you really do care about correcting the matter. And it's not just LVCV, it's the hotel properties, yes. it's our stakeholders, they feel the same way about it, and uh, they have whole departments devoted to it. They're just not going to, they want to bring that guest back. Absolutely, concierge, VIP, yeah. casino marketing, uh, casino coordinators, all all, the, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hospitality has it too. Lastly, one more. 5 to 20% probability of selling to a new prospect at 60 to 70% probability of selling to an existing customer. Say that one one more time. Oh, five? Yes. <laughs> Say five, that one again. 5 to 20% probability of selling to a new prospect and 60 to 70% probability of selling to an existing cup. In other words, the probability of selling to an existing customer is sounds like three times as high Higher than is selling, selling to a new one. A new one. Okay. Yes. All yes, right. I get that. And I, I believe that. In other words, they're already buying whatever the, the, the offering is now. If you have further offering and you're satisfying them and you're leaving them feeling great about whatever it is that yeah. they're already buying, then be more be apt to buy mm -hmm. other things you have to right. sell versus a new person that hasn't experienced it yet. Right. Yeah. Makes yep, sense? Yep, yep. That makes a lot of sense. It does. No, absolutely. And, and kind of tying into our role, what we do is uh, we get inquiries from other people that want to come here and they want their show in the first week of January. So, well, CES takes away the town. Uh, there are certain time frames, and either we're booked and we don't have anything for them, but we will share that lead with Sands Expo, Manley Bay, say, have you thought about them? Maybe they have dates, and we help them find a home. So we don't compete. If, it's, if they can't be in our building, that's fine. We just want them in this destination. For sure. Mm -hmm. Same with hotel, the corporate events that come here. Uh, not everybody can afford the Bellagio, but maybe they can afford Flamingo. So right. there are a lot of price points, a lot of options, but uh, the authority's job is to share that, those leads, and help them find a home, get them in the destination. We don't care what building they're in, but mm -hmm. just get, you know, them get them here and, and make them work. If you were just our building and we said, sorry, I can't help you, yeah, they're going to go look at other destinations. Yeah. Very, very, yeah. That's, that's spot on. That makes a lot of sense, and it's true. And the reality of it is, even Las Vegas recently understood that we are not recession-proof. That was new for the first time for us just recently. Right. You know, this is actually a good time for a quick segue here. We're going to actually, we have some some fan mail, actually. Okay. And we want you to participate in this fan mail. This is, these, this is one of the audience members and or listeners that viewed a few shows just recently, and they have some thoughts. Go ahead and share those, Lisa. This and comes in from Christina. Hi, Lisa and Jesse. I loved episode 33, which was the three critical tips on how to say no. I'm one of those people that have problems with saying no. I have a follow-up question to the episode. How do you say no when you've always said yes, and it's now just assumed you will take on any new project, task, etc., without being asked? So, for me, what would happen in that situation if I was working with her, say, from the coaching perspective, if she was a client of ours, I would say we want to turn around that paradigm of their expectation. And I don't think it's a flip. I think it's a transition. I would help help this person, this, Christina. Christina, I would help her to start to understand that her language needs to change instead of always readily saying the yes and then regretting or having challenges completing it because she's over it's overflowing. When she gets a request, the first thing, first thing she does is takes what I call a stand down. We call it a stand down. You don't have to accept it right away. You can say, let me give some consideration to that or let me think about that. So I would, be, I would coach her to say, let me think about that and get back to you. Let me check my schedule and I'll see if that can work out. That way it gives her a chance. Or my workload. Let me see what's right. on my plate. Yeah. I would use, yeah, either that. And I would, so give that room to breathe. Then if she, then she can truly look at her full circle and say, should I be taking this on? Mm -hmm. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, then she can go back and, you know, I would love to be able to help you with this. This time I'm not going to be able to do it because we have prior commitments that if I took this on, they would fail. That, so she's going to have to start the dialogue. But when you've been used to saying yes all the time, it's hard to just say no right there. But if there's some breathing room, then she gets to come back and say, after she takes the stand down, do not 
commit to it right there. Say, let me take a look at the schedule and timing and see if I can work Well, they out. probably come back to her because she always does say yes and nobody else Correct. says no. So they're used well to said. going to her to get what they want. So her question is, how do you do that if you're well, stuck could that Could you way? also come back to her and say, I really am <laughs> swamped or whatever, but have you thought about so-and-so? With the solution. Yeah. With That's the really solution. Good. That's well That's said. Very good. Also yeah. with the Give solution. some other option. Yeah. yeah. And and I, I like that, giving, giving them other options. You know what I also like, you is saying to them something like, like I just mentioned, I would love to be able to assist with this because they're used to her being able to do it, no matter what. However, if I were to take it on, other important matters would fail. She doesn't have to tell them what it is, and it's, and it's likely true. So that lets yeah. them know she's not just saying no because she doesn't want to do it. She's saying no because it doesn't make sense for her to do it. That's a good one. What else does she say? She said, I'm also the only female among my coworkers, so I know being assertive can come off differently for me than my coworkers. In episode 34, which was overcoming first-time manager challenges, uh, you discussed how a poor leader can cause high turnover and leave remaining employees unmotivated. The goal is not to get to that point, but say you already are at that point. What are some things that employees under poor supervising, under a poor supervisor can do to improve turn- turnover, motivation, or morale? I have a thought on that. That seems like a heavy one, doesn't it? Yeah. I have a thought on that. You join in and cut in anytime you want. And you as you as well, Lisa. You and Lisa just join in. My thought is you have an opportunity with a situation like that. You can't be your boss's boss, but you can help retrain your boss in a very subtle way. And you can also help reach re, retrain the staff in ways to support by you adding additional support where it makes sense, where you're not wearing yourself out. And I call it helping others with their homework. I found that when I was in corporate America, I grew incredibly great relationships with my with the people that I work with for the most part, almost all the time, and other departments and the and people directly in my department by helping them with the things they were not good at, by offering the things that I may have been better at or really good at. Say, Hugh, would you like? Let's let's assume Hugh, you had a problem with, um, let's say, a new directive, a new directive that came out, and let's say they were going to come to your department, they were going to have you. Uh, you had to pass, it was either pass or fail, and they had your boss on the other end of the line, and you had to be on the spot to answer these customer-related, customer service-related questions. What if you're not used to being on the spot and you don't like that? Well, that actually happened in one of the places I work. Well, the people that were just mortified and literally in tears crying over it, I pulled, I pulled them aside, and I said, I think I can help you with this if you like. How many people do you think rejected my help? Zero. None. Yeah. So help them with the things that you are good at where you can help them and ask for their permission, and they will typically do that. Now, the help you're providing would be the things that would help those supervisors and managers be better at the things they're not and the team to be better at managing the things that the bosses may not be good at. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it I does. call it helping with the homework. Yeah. But also sounds like they need a, a better c- communication on the inside because – when it when it says the things with employees under with with poor supervisor, how do we improve turnover, motivation, and morale? Communication. You know, let's have good, open, and honest communication. But what if your boss is a poor communicator? Mm-hmm. Now, how do you do good communication? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you have to find a way to help help them with their homework, the, the homework that they stop doing, that needs to be done to raise that raise the equity of that situation. Yeah. That's a good thought, yeah. but what if the boss is a terrible communicator? Yeah. Wow, what else? Did she say anything else? No, I like this said, Christine she, person. She just said thanks in advance. She's really enjoying the show. You Keep tell up that, the great work. You tell that woman, thanks for thanks, challenging Christine. the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh, uh, very, very good having you on the program. Oh, I just, thank you, you, Jess. Uh, tell us, what did, you, what did you like best about being on Conversations? Well, this was unique. It's the first time I've had this kind of experience. Another good one uh, for me and uh, you two have made quite an impression on me. I'm glad that I met you recently through a mutual friend. Uh, it's just a real Can I bizarre say story. Can I sure. say his Yes, name? you may. Yes. His name is John Kittle. Kittle. By Alpha John. Hey, John and <laughs> By Alpha John. <laughs> so John Kittle and Annie Kittle, the two sweethearts out of Florida, they're two blonde beauties is what they are. And, we, and John is a charmer. And we thank you for the introduction to Mr. We do. Hugh. And yes. so you realize, did you talk to your bride? Did you let her know we're going to be spending some nights with Stan at night with you from occasionally when we feel like it? Did you let I her? haven't broken that to her. Okay, fair enough. Yes. <laughs> and when is this taking place? Right. <laughs> do, we need to, do we need to get permission from John? You think John will let no, us do that too? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh. I think we need it from Hugh first. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. No, this was really powerful. You are a perfect fit for this 
subject matter. I mean, the, this the the customer experience and how to empower that and embrace that. Your, the way you responded, uh, the offering. I'm sure our listeners and our audience, uh, folks out there, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't get more. In fact, you now have to tune into the next episode. You're oh, committed. Definitely. I will. I because, may write in myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you have some questions that you might right. want answered. <laughs> no, but you. I guarantee there's going to be someone to write in about this dialogue and this communication and this conversation. So it'll be good for you to, to, to hear that. So you we can know we can count on John Kittle for one. Yes, he better. indeed. John Kittle, if you're out there listening, <laughs> you better write in. Yeah, no, this is good. So you have left me feeling in a way that uh, we've had a number of really great experts on the program like yourself, but this was a, a nice rhythm to a brand new relationship with a wonderful stride and a wonderful step. And you left me feeling great. And Lisa has a saying about leaving people feeling great. What is it all about, Liz? It is all about how you leave them feeling, Hugh. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.